Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Hospitality Maverick podcast with me, Michael Tingser. We at Hospitality Mavericks are here to inspire leaders and entrepreneurs in the hospitality and restaurant industry to create heart-centered and profitable businesses from the inside out, the kind that both employees and customers love and support. In today's podcast, we're joined by Samantha Clark, who is a happiness consultant that helps workplaces to boost performance through providing coaching and advisory service to founders and leaders and all those who manage people. And the end goal is to build culture just the people want to join. We sat down with Samantha to talk about happiness in the workplace, leadership, employee engagement, and how she worked with Dishoom to help them define their leadership approach and build a very unique culture. So grab headphones and coffee and enjoy. Welcome to the Hospitality Maverick podcast, Samantha. We're very excited to have here today because we're going to talk about something we believe a lot in, happiness at workplace, or it starts in the center of everything. It's about people and them feeling good about what they do. So welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So just for the people out there that maybe doesn't have heard about you before and what you do, can you tell a bit about your, your background and why you set out on a mission to make happy work life and mm. happy organization? Sure. So my name is Samantha, obviously. I'm a happiness consultant and the founder of the Growth and Happiness School. And I've had a a quite an eclectic journey getting to this place of consulting on happiness. I was in advertising and branding for a very long time and I just didn't feel alive in the industry. I just didn't feel like I was really contributing to wider transformation or purpose. And I was stuck in my own concerns around what work happiness should look like and how I should feel at work. And so I went on a bit of a journey exploring different routes. And when I started coaching, and working with individuals, a common complaint was work. If it wasn't a toxic culture, it was thinking about the boss that they had or how do I show up as a leader? Should I start working for myself? Should I not? Am I better suited as an employee? And I loved all of these different questions. And so I retrained as a coach and I started working with a tech company and they wanted to do things very differently. They were looking to be entirely remote and they just thought, how can we do culture differently when we can't see each other? And they'd been in a traditional agency sense. So I started as their head of happiness. I created uh, kind of internal coaching programs, uh, looking at events, different happiness practices and their culture and all of that set up for about two years. And then I just decided to branch out on my own and really looked at how I can bring a different version of what happiness can be in the workplace and how we can motivate leaders, senior leadership teams to really think about the individual employee and also how the employee can show up and participate and be proactive in their own work happiness too. If you had to define happiness, because that's always, you know, a lot of conversation when you take it into the the commercial world and you start to use this word that's almost already a red flag happening and Mm. and especially when you take it to the sea level. So what is happiness for you? Is that just, you know, all the, the fluffy stuff, you know, benefits, you know, happy clap chat, paid food, etc table tennis what else take your dog to work (laughs) yeah I couldn't be further from that I've always said that I'm not about the gimmicks or the fluff when it comes to happiness and for me I'm fundamentally looking at the core of what it takes to make your people show up and feel great in terms of the workplace what's the environment and the culture that you can create that stimulates that and I've created my own I guess happiness pillars and what I do is look at a company across very nuanced levels in terms of communicate and connect that's one pillar work and life digital and mindful and head and heart and for me it's about assessing where a company sits across those areas and then you start to introduce practices and systems processes and different initiatives that help them recalibrate where they might sit across those pillars a lot of the time as a consultant it can be quite easy to go in with your proven strategy and I'm all about listening I speak to them and I say what's going on for you what are the big problems that you're seeing what are the issues and through the language that they use you can start to see where the cracks are and then you can say okay these are the remedies we can look at to increase the happiness and it's not just about applying you know free yoga on Fridays or you know the fact that we've got beer on tap you know all of those things are often in isolation when there are bigger cracks that need polyfiller they need filling in different ways and you're not going to paper over it with free gym or whatever so I think it's a lot more of a textured approach that I offer. It's quite interesting when you say language because I guess also there's emotion in that Mm -hmm. as well you can feel if people talk about 
about it in a relaxed way, working and stuff like that. And as always, as you said earlier as well, I, I've heard this much well, it's, it's always comes back to the boss. In our view, people don't leave a business or a location or whatever it is. It is often because an individual in a relationship with a boss or a very toxic relationship with colleagues. So when, when you work with the clients, what uh, you said you had a, a specific approach with the pillars. What is typical, the sequence of things happening there? When they engage with you, what is the, often the reason why they come to you? I'll hear a lot of things like oh, either we've had you know high attrition, we're losing key people, or everyone's stressed out, they're feeling a little bit overburdened. Perhaps they have seen a decrease in creativity across certain teams, or there is not enough collaboration. I will essentially kind of have that exploratory phase with them really delving into when these things happened, what would they hope to achieve, what are the kinds of things that they're hearing from their employees. And then I'll do a happiness health check, which will be a mixture of interviewing some key individuals across different areas, so employees, the senior management, to get a real overview of what's going on in the company and look at each of these pillars. So I think I mentioned what the pillars are, so head and heart is very much around resilience and confidence and thinking whether or not your employees have the tenacity to bounce back from problems thinking about communication and connection it's like how are the relationships within the company where can you see different fault lines between a manager and employee relationships that are causing poor work or causing poor creativity thinking about digital and mindful what practices can you kind of create that are more preventative solutions to the stress and the overwhelm that comes from tech versus just dealing with the cracks that happen afterwards And lastly, we're thinking about work and life. So what are the workplace structure and policies that help people to be better? So as I go through, I check across each of those pillars where a company sits. And then from there, we start a plan of action of different activities. It might be coaching. It might be learning and development workshops, webinars. It might be retreats, strategy sessions. It's a very pick and mix approach because I don't think that one size fits all. So in a way, you identify the problems and then you develop develop the right solution for that specific client so you actually unleash the biggest potential they have within the situation uh, and we, we totally agree as well we don't believe there's a cookie cutter approach no. to solve especially not leadership and cultural problems and I think it's important also that I'm not always dictating the solution I do um, help leaders to galvanize almost like a, a happiness committee so it's a mixture of the leader but also you know some employees across different departments so that it's a co-created experience I think that oftentimes a lot of happiness solutions or consultants can come in and say this needs to work this way. When actually if you co-create something top bottom, bottom up, people have a voice and they feel like they're more likely to buy into this and that actually has the transformation that you seek and then it works because then a lot of time people are like oh happiness solutions it doesn't work we've tried this and the fact is that Whilst meditation classes or yoga might suit 30% of the workforce, other people probably don't understand it, probably don't get on with it. And they would might rather, you know, an increase in their learning budget and that would propel them to be better at something else. Or maybe they want to take up a public speaking class. And so by co-creating the methods together and me guiding them and facilitating that conversation, we can get richer outcomes. This, this is super interesting what you just said. I've been some years in HR myself and that was within McDonald's. And uh, I think when I reflect back after that, I think one of the things I've seen and I talk with a lot of HR leaders and directors at that point is that we try to create this, you know, one way approach, you know, everybody's doing yoga, for example. Mm -hmm you may be actually alienating your mm. biggest talent because they don't like to do exercise and that's their choice. So it's about, again, this personalization and you need to understand that as a leader as well. And this is actually as much as I think you said it before, but like understanding your people and the individual and take that time to understand yourself and them because that's, that's, that's where the magic is in a way. You know, you're working within a system and there's different ecosystems within a big company. Different departments will have their own way of working. Different teams will have their own functioning capacity and it's about, fair enough, we can't please everybody and I'm not saying that you're able to at each point but it's like how can we listen to different voices and really underpin solutions that resonate with the majority at least so that it can be something people really care about and believe in and believe that you as a manager are actually actively making change versus just talking about it and I guess again it comes down to this you know there's been a lot of talk and I've seen you 
put it out there as well around gallops. Gallup have looked into the engagement rate on a global level. Mm. Um, uh, and I guess it's different from industry to industry, but uh, maybe it isn't. Maybe it's just in general, we are not engaged in our work. I think, what is it, 30? 30%, 30%, yeah. 13%, that, that's quite scary. The 30% mm. there's like feeling a wider purpose of mm. going to work. And mm-hmm. actually, it's not just to, to pay the bills. There's something that makes them excited, get out of bed in the morning. You know, this is a topic that I'm, I'm really loving at the moment. It's, you know, I'm writing a book around this. Well, the book's called Love It or Leave It. And I, I really think that we need to tap into how do we help people fall in love with their jobs and really tap into what is it that's missing for them? Is it that purpose kind of panache that is not there Is it a mindset thing? Is it the environment? What can we do from a leadership perspective to alter cultures? Or if they are going to leave, how do we um, help people to leave with grace or figure out different solutions that might be right for them so that we're also as a company being efficient with the people we have, retaining the people who really want to stay and allowing those who probably don't want to anymore to kind of leave with and be better elsewhere. I want to move people out of just doing the job for the money and thinking actually if I'm spending majority of my week here my life working why don't I do something that sets me up and makes me feel happy and good and nurtured from a mental and physical perspective I guess this is a challenge across many sectors and and especially in in the hospitality and restaurant sector where we are we we see it as well talent is running out of the door they call it the talent crisis I think that's the the newest word it was talent (laughs) cliff now it's going to a talent crisis and I call it a leadership crisis because Mm. to start with leadership and you have an article recently I think it was in May on LinkedIn where you talked a bit about leadership starts with you as an individual leader and actually taking care of yourself and Mm -hmm. get yourself balanced out can you elaborate a bit what you mean by that because often leadership is about leading the an organization Mm. team it's not so much about leading yourself yeah I, I think it's so important as a leader to think about the different nuanced perspectives of what leadership is and it starts with self leadership if you do not have a deep understanding of how you come across how you resonate with other people and how you balance your mood how you navigate stress all of that has a ripple effect on the people you're trying to lead and I think if you don't have a clear vision on your different facets of leadership so are you more of a cross-pollinator a visionary a mentor a coach the technician type of person where is the balance off do you know how to bob and weave using those different skills with different people and so that all comes from that deep reflection of how am I doing as a leader how am I showing up what conversations am I avoiding which ones am I leaning into how do I start to investigate what my blind spots are so what are you saying is in principle that the leader is accountable for making this work to create the happy workforce? I think it's both ways. I definitely feel that the conversation around happiness at work is a two-way street. I think the leaders definitely need to think how am I showing up and what is the vision I'm creating for this company that I'm building? And how am I educating others around the purpose and bringing them along for the ride? But I also think that the employee, we're in a great place now to be proactive about what works for us at work and what doesn't. And how can we articulate that rather than throw your toys out the pram? It's a case of articulating what you need to be better at your job and how certain things are working great and what isn't working great and what solutions can you provide because it's not again about like this doesn't work I hate my job because of x okay what are the solutions how can you have more of those deeper conversations those richer conversations where it's why don't we do this make suggestions tweak things so I think from both sides there is a responsibility to make happiness at work a reality together and also we're coming back to leading yourself I guess people yeah. in today's environment I think we're moving away from where you actually manage where there's actually a bit of more expectation than you can lead yourself mm. but of course you need to give people the tools to be able to lead themselves that's a big request suddenly of to course. give people that you know responsibility you have to lead yourself you have mm. to set your own goals you have to set your own standards to mm. That's coming back to, again, that's part of that journey of the way we change organizational models. As you just said, people decide that we are 100% remote. We maybe may meet once a a month in London and that's it. And uh, some companies can do that because they need, especially hospitality, they need to be physical at the same place to to provide the service. But it's interesting as you design different organizational models, how you actually need to start changing leadership to become more conversation and dialogues Mm -hmm. than direction and delegation. Of course. you know that is that whole process of situational leadership i don't think it's a complete moving away from delegating or demanding that you need to do x y and z i think it's being able to be as a leader 
that flexible to bob and weave and know actually I need to lean into the conversation now. I need to talk to somebody. I need to coach somebody through this. I might need to play mentor right now. Or maybe I I just need to be a conduit for them to do great things. So if I am your source of information, insight when you need it, I'm here but I'm gonna allow you to do what you need to do. And then also knowing the skill and the will of your team. If they need help, can you step in and delegate or make suggestions? So I think it is requiring leaders to be a little bit more flexible and less resistant to kind of just staying with one model that feels safe for them. We believe in the same things and we want to transform the same things in an organization. But do you meet skeptics out there that says this this, this is all good, you know? It's like talking purple cows, you know? Mm. But what is my return of investment? when it's going to work for me. Yeah, and and you know, at the end of the day, we have to be realistic. Business is business, right? There mm. is a bottom line that needs to be achieved. But I think when you ask a leader, you know, what are the core things that make up their company? Some might mention the product or the service, but fundamentally, they'll always go back to the people. Well, if it is the people, what are you doing about it to make sure that you're retaining and attracting great people? It starts with you having a very deep understanding of not only your employer brand, not only the people that you're hiring and their leadership abilities and skills but also what is the kind of ecosystem that you're creating to support great people because also not only is there talent cliff and crisis in that way but people especially the younger generation are like yeah, actually if it doesn't work for me here I'm leaving you've got to be aware that people have so much freedom of choice and free will now if you are not putting people at the heart of your business they will go elsewhere where somebody else is and it pays to just think you know this is a ripple effect The person that comes into your company, they are coming from a different ecosystem within their family. They're coming into your workplace and whatever they're taking from work, they're then taking back into their home life. And it's a cyclical societal thing. You know, how you're nurturing and supporting the person at work is also they'll take that energy back home. And so I think it pays for us to think about the interdependence of work, life, community, culture as a whole, society. It all plays into the same thing. So I think happy companies equal happy communities, happy communities equal happy societies. It's so important that we understand that there's no like clear borders that was like in the old days, I call it, where there was like queer border. You went to work and then you went home and then you were a different person at work and then you were at home where mm-hmm. we actually much more connected and balanced out, as you said. Mm-hmm. So if you have to give an example then, because people are thinking who is actually doing this and what kind mm-hmm. of outcomes are they getting? Would there be any, or oh, I know there's a couple of uh, restaurant and hospitality businesses that would be quite interesting to hear one of my favorite business myself looking from the outside is like Dishoom. They, mm-hmm. they have some magic going on there they and I know do. and I know you, do. I know you've done some work with them so I was very honored to take them through a very long journey delving into what is their sever leadership so what is the Dishoom way of leading and how could they really take their area managers senior head managers head chefs on a journey to figuring out what does it take for them to be great leaders so we're looking at that self-leadership that personal insight and also the areas where they feel like they're struggling their blind spots their different weaknesses and then also how do they then use that to enrich the teams that they have across their different locations and I really love the fact that Dishoom were open to looking at it from a very inclusive journey so you know oftentimes I think restaurants are like let's just deal with front of house and it was very important for them to get the head chefs on board as well to look at what is that ecosystem in the kitchen because that then affects the front of house and you know we did a really beautiful journey together that was a mixture of kind of workshops I also gave them different materials to kind of see, learn, do, so that they had to go out into their environment and explore different things, different exercises with loved ones at home. Just getting them to feel quite rich in their understanding of what it was to be a leader and a manager, but also looking at it from a team perspective, you know, so how do we start to have better conversations around work-life balance and stress and, you know, having those difficult conversations when people are late and all of that. So it's, you know, playing on those practical relational issues inside restaurants but also from a personal perspective you know what am I doing in my home life how am I having deeper richer conversations with the people that I love how can they support me when I'm stressed and working crazy hours and it was just a lovely journey and you know they have then seen all those people that I've been on that journey with are still retained in the company they have great teams they have very low turnover so I think there's just something really beautiful about a company that's like we want to do things differently we want to think about leadership differently also 
you know, they have the cultural perspective as well. So very rich in kind of Asian philosophies and practical ways of being and supporting people. And I think they wanted to thread that through what leadership looks like for them too. So there's lots of heritage and cultural pieces that we did too. I loved it. And I think that I will always have a soft spot for the shoe. Just whenever I see them and I go in to eat, it's just nice seeing their faces and that they're putting these things into practice and that they have, you know, those moments where like, oh my gosh, I, I did this thing and I had this conversation with my partner and it just set me up for work the next day and all of these different ripple effects. And again, it's interesting coming back to that they decided they want to do it differently. They didn't know the outcome, but mm. they decided to invest because they knew investing in it would take us to a better place. Right. And I think it's it's just knowing that, do you know what, let's let's try. We could go about it in a set way. We could just set up a, a standard HR culture process and follow this like every other restaurant has done. Or do we really take the time to define a different form of leadership? Because we are a different type of restaurant. Yep. And we are growing at great pace. We're providing new food experiences and new ways of embracing a different type of food. So consequently, the leadership has to be different. And I think it's just going with that flow. And I think a lot of companies need to take off the kind of blinkered glasses that they might have around what well-being, happiness, leadership culture development should look like and just try something new just be open to that journey and be open to having difficult tough conversations with your colleague who is also you know in some cases a competitor right you're trying to do the most sales in this location versus another location so you're all trying to find ways to make sure your teams are the greatest but you're coming together for a bigger good. I normally say that strong company culture or purpose comes from that everybody have that shared language. They understand mm. that they march under the same banner. They yep. understand why we're going to work every day. And that's what that gets them there. And then that makes them want to do better yeah. because they need to deliver that purpose because that's what they, they connected to in a way. And, I, and you can see that. I have never been in a room yet where I couldn't feel they were very connected as a mm. team. And, and you say there's like a lot of traditional ways of doing people. Do you need age? HR, because some people say that HR is dead. That's not going to be used anymore. And one of my beliefs self is that, of course, there's the, the processes. There's mm -hmm. some basic processes. You know, your employee journey needs to be defined mm. and you need to give them contracts and great onboarding and training and all that. But I, my, my view is that the leader also needs to make more responsibility for that employee journey. It's not HR's journey. Mm. HR is just the expert to come and help you and train you right. to become good in that. Yeah, I totally agree. I think HR, there's so much that can be outsourced and automated in terms of, you know, the contracts, the setting up but I think HR could now step into more of a people role and look at how do we encourage leaders to have different conversations how do we get them to get under the skin of what's really happening and for them to feed back on what an employee journey should look like and I always call it like the employee experience map from the minute someone comes into your company to when you have to say goodbye to them, what are the touch points at each stage that bring happiness? And it's not just about, yes, we need to make sure they get bonus at six months. We need to have performance review at this time. It's other things. It's like, how are we helping that employee learn? How are they learning as part of a team? What are they doing and as an experience as an individual and as part of a team? And all of these different waves, again, are conversations that leaders can have with HR and HR can bounce back. I think there is more of a people experience, talent place now. I don't think it needs to be called HR or if HR is still having that strong emphasis in the company now. I think we need to look at happiness, well-being. I think we need to look at the experience of what it means to be in your company and that feels like a richer place to sit. Yeah, and I guess also just the word human resources yeah. says a bit about like, way back in industrial society mm. where you own people's life and you put them on a factory to, to work for you. And I guess where we are heading now is a bit more an exclusive model where work flows and life flows and it's a lifestyle mm. in principle you sign up to. And when it comes to hospitality and you've probably seen that working, I know you work with a, a couple of others as well uh, within the hospitality industry, you've probably seen that it's, it's quite a tough environment sometimes and there's not much time and there's a lot mm. of pressure on these, you know, especially the, the leaders and the managers Managers. Mm. We talked about this, the manager's responsibility. We also have to remember these people are hit by so many demands from the top, from a business result mm -hmm. point of view, and then the bottom of, I want a great place to work. In your view, if you look at the industry from a happiness consultancy, how would you say that we are, as an, you know, an industry, you know, maybe we can start overcoming some of these challenges because we have massive turnover. Brexit hasn't helped. So suddenly you can't find people to do the basic work. So mm. one of the things now I've talked with a lot of uh, senior people recently, they all say, the first thing that says, well, I always ask, 
question of the question, what is your biggest leadership challenge right now to say getting people and retain them? So why, why do you think the industry comes to that? That that's not it's not creating sales. It's not creating new products. I believe that the the core issue around retention and talent is asking, you know, what what is it that I can do to make this experience slightly better for you? Because fundamentally, the hours are what they are in terms of how the restaurant is opening, the people that you need to serve. So what else can we do beyond the set parameters of how this business operates? And okay, so if you as a person are struggling, what can we do to make your life better? So when you come to work, like you can focus freely on work. How can we look at the different challenges that you're under? Is it the fact that our communication is broken across different areas, so we need to tighten that up? What do you need in terms of making sure that you've eaten well and slept well? Like all of these other facets, because like I said before, it's not just somebody coming in and showing up at work. And I think a lot of time when I go into restaurants and I see people feeling dejected, the company doesn't really care about that person. They're just like, you need to fill this slot and you need to make sure that the coffee is served on time or that the meal is served on time. And I think I was at a conference recently, a Quinix conference, and it was looking at how do we help create more flexibility and nuanced understanding for unsociable working hours. And it is just a case of, okay, what does that person need in terms of rotor scheduling, in terms of personal benefits, in terms of maybe there is something that they would like to learn or do outside of work on their time off. It's having those conversations and I don't think that the leaders are doing that in the first place. Because even when I think about the Dishoom journey, so much came up in our sessions. Even the head of talent was like, I'd never know any of this. I wouldn't be able to have these forums for conversation. So it's great that we're starting to do this and we, we have a deeper understanding. And I think that we use time as an excuse not to have those conversations. Yeah, and that's the critical. I'm busy. I need, I need you yeah. know, I need to cover the next shift. Right. There's always a burn. There's always a fire to put out. And I think there's also a lot of these things happen because of the firefighting mentality. Mm. Are you accepting that's happening to you? As you said, you could you said HR process could be automated. Tech can also automate a lot from of an course. operational point of view so the managers actually get that time. Yes, and, and that was one of the big things that we discovered it's like I always think that planning and just mindful awareness of where the fire points are going to come can help you create a better system and a better way of doing things so a lot of the time I think that managers are under stress because either they don't know how to delegate and they take on too much and they're like it's my burden versus trusting and empowering your team to take on different challenges to take on different responsibilities to train them to give them the tools so that they can take the stress off you and so I think managers are always trying to firefight because they don't trust that other people can deliver in the same way. And I think some of these employees are looking for more responsibility, are looking for ways to prove that they can excel in different areas. And so, again, it's a conversation. And it's quite interesting. A guy, uh, Stephen R. Corey, wrote a book years ago called Speed of Trust. Mm. And that's the only thing you have as a leader. And leader often forgets that. They can either control things yeah. and then close the interaction gap or they can start trusting people and actually make wonderful things happen. And I've seen it myself like training because as a responsible for ops I had a lot of people underneath me and I had these mid managers and the biggest challenge we had all the time was actually get out of the way mm. let your people open and close that store mm. if you stand there every morning and do it for them they're mm -hmm. never going to get better mm. so it's actually that, that trust thing but it was more uh, they were not sure they were ready themselves so it's yeah. about right, getting them ready back to self leadership of course um, it's a cycle right yeah. it's just thinking if, if you're not able to deliver it outwards it's because you haven't started with the inward journey this is something I learned I I did a uh, gross national happiness facilitator program and it was looking at the Bhutanese model of happiness because they obviously have used gross national happiness as their kind of version of GDP. You know, they always say that transformation, if you're looking for transformation outside, it has to start internally and you have to do the work first within yourself, looking at what are the triggers, what's not going right for me, and how can I see that rippling out in the environment around me? Yeah, and I think that's interesting, and just if you sit as a, an executive leadership team, you have to start look inwards, not outwards for mm. the solution. I've seen a lot of uh, restaurants now starting talking about, which, which I think is a great thing, they talk about four day work week and, mm. You know, trying to take a bit of that pressure off and stuff like that. But that's, again, in my world, it's a tactic. Mm -hmm. You're not really getting into the deep understanding why. Because I don't think the four-day work week in itself 
going to solve the talent problem. It, it's part I mean, of the solution. I well. think it's part of the solution, but it's not everything. And also it's it's then understanding in that four day week, you know, how, how long or how more extended are those hours so that when the person does have the time off, are they just too shattered to actually do anything else with their life? And so I think, you know, it's a, it's a case for, again, talking to your employees. What do you want? We're thinking about doing a four day week. How might that benefit you to look after childcare responsibilities? Or maybe you're a carer and you're doing this, or perhaps you're trying to learn English or another skill. Is this going to be beneficial to you? Or would you prefer to do the shifts that you have, but like have a bit more flexibility on when you do them and using technology to support those decisions? So again, it's the conversation, you know, oftentimes when we look at, I guess, office based companies, you know, they have these stand up morning meetings and they do this. And I think a lot of the restaurant kind of based meetings are around numbers. This is the targets we did yesterday. This is great. Um, we had a couple of complaints here, but there's not enough of that richer conversation around the people element. I took over some restaurants in my career and my, my often did the turnaround piece where I often find out why I did that was because there was the people factor. I mm. love that because change is people. And I often asked them, so what do you expect of me? Mm. That was my oh, first question. Great question. And often they didn't know what to say. They yeah. were afraid if they gave me their, an honest answer, they will be fired. And I found out, oh, actually I'm getting in, I'm going too deep too quickly because mm. I was very confident that we needed to talk. But people also, you need to take this as a journey where if you're ready that as a leader, you have to understand your people are not, maybe not ready to have of these course. deep conversations you talk about. And you go on that journey and you will see magic happen because suddenly you are having conversation and conversation builds relationship. Yeah. Trust and respect is mm -hmm. influence. But coming back to that, you said you, you mentioned tech a couple of times and we really agree that tech can help you to do the heavy lifting for many things so you can have more fruitful conversation or keeping that term. So so where do you see that the uh companies are going compared how to use tech in the right way because so tech can also be almost all consuming because you have your phone you have yeah. your laptop you have all these impulses is coming at you at a speed like your brain is working on overload all the time mm. and i i know for myself sometimes just grabbing myself so i just need you know i just need a bit of headspace mm. it's uh it's really funny because i think you know we have to be open to the fact that yes tech can serve us but we don't need to be serving it And so it's looking at what are the core ways in which we're using technology to give us back time, to automate things, to clear the shelves or clear the decks. And when is it hampering our ability to actually get the work done? So one kind of radical solution I tried with the company was getting them to implement email only hours. And then the rest of the working day was about flow work. Once everyone is trained and on board with, okay, you will get answers to emails between these particular times. If it's an emergency, you call somebody and if not then you know that you'll get responses at these particular times in the day other than that they are in flow work and so I think a lot of companies need to really address things like email policy things like mobile use I remember reading a report once that you know 70% of people are checking work emails at like one in the morning there's so much in the media at the moment about sleep and the importance of making sure that you get a great night's sleep so how does that aid that conversation and I think the problem with technology is that if at a senior level there isn't a fair use policy or a, a kind of distinction of how we should be operating effectively then it doesn't trickle down and so if somebody emails you you're under pressure to kind of respond back and and then we get into that cycle I also think it's important when I look at the digital and mindful pillar is how much are we taking the time to have more connected practices more contemplative practices yes that might look like yoga it might look like meditation it might look like having Having your strategy or your co-working session outside in the park versus in a stuffy office or it might be going on a walking meeting versus just sitting at your desk and everyone's got their phones out or perhaps it's stacking all the mobiles at the corner of the meeting room and maybe there's one note taker for the meeting and everyone else is actually present and involved in the meeting no notes no pads whatever they're just there talking so it's really redefining different ways that we can strip back and get back to basics which is doing the business working with people showing up delivering our greatest and using the technology to facilitate that versus hamper it. Yeah, and I totally agree because sometimes technology is actually slowing us down because we're going to be interrupted by it. Yeah. Instead of actually doing that deep piece of work you need on that piece of work that, that maybe is 20% of your day that creates 80% of your productivity. Yes. 
and and then you get behind with that and then you feel the stress of that deadline and then the catch up and the tension around that and you know it's just that general I feel perpetually behind and then everyone's always busy walking meetings are very effectful that's something we use ourselves here we just did one this morning where we walked from Victoria and up here to uh, St. James Park and that way up and uh, we got three great ideas we wouldn't have had in a table with a coffee right because then you just get static and we have to think you know our bodies are meant to be moving our brain needs stimulation in different ways it also needs time to reflect and I just think that getting out into nature feeling the air and and having those I remember working with a team of developers and you know from their perspective they love their work but they were like actually for us to brainstorm and get those creative juices we need to do something else so I set them with like a little art adventure so they went out into the park and kind of just used different materials painted for a bit and then came together for a strategy session on a pitch and so it was just having that time to kind of use their hands use their brain differently that then facilitated greater conversation around the problem that needed to be solved or the ideas that they wanted to generate. When we talk about practices, is there like one thing you think that really like has, would you go in in any company, any, any leader or leadership team to think about like one thing they should start doing like where you say that would have a massive impact. It's very low hanging fruit and will have a massive impact on your happiness. Or do you think you need to go on a journey to get an impact? I think that as long as the leaders are perpetually asking, what can we do differently today? What do you need from us to be great? You know, it's just asking just different pivotal questions. And sometimes it's a case of so there's different ways of doing this in terms of lunch or coffee roulette. But like sticking a question in a hat and just taking a random person out for a quick coffee and there's a question between the two of you if we had fifty thousand pounds to inject into our team development what might it look like how would that help us to be better and i think when we start asking provocative questions versus just the standard bog standard way of looking at work i think that's how we get innovation and disruption the service conversations where polite conversation exactly and i think we just need to be a little bit like what's not working well here where do you get all your inspiration to because it is it's a tough sell you're coming here to do to to companies i think they're getting more open to it but mm. where did you get like your inspiration to keep yourself going in in your day and life who who is your maverick so oh gosh i watch read listen to everything so yeah. i think for me i'm always looking at disruption and from a science perspective from art i love listening to different podcasts always got like 50 tabs open of that i'm just reading for inspiration and i think you know much like what you do i don't think that i just need to learn about culture from a business perspective or from hospitality in your perspective it's about looking at different crafts and so how is science disrupting the way that we think about how products could be creative how when I look at a piece of art I always make sure I get out and go to galleries I love facilitating and talking to people so I teach a lot of workshops at the School of Life and the Guardian just hearing what people are talking about and how they they the words that they use around work and the books that they're reading that triggers me in a different way I'm always just scouring Goodreads for just different recommendations in terms of books I love listening to people like Tim Ferriss like I'm just in awe of the different people that he looks at from a performance perspective and then I'm like how can I translate that to culture just everything <laughs> so that's not like one source you go to and that, that's quite interesting because I think I'm, I'm very similar in a way and it, it goes in phases what yeah. I dive into and I'm I'm a very big fan of Tim Ferriss as well and one of the things we're looking at always what are the best of the best doing mm. and how are they hacking these behaviors yeah. to get it right you mm. know because that's what Maverick does they yeah, set a yeah, new yeah, standard yeah. for themselves every day yeah. and they try to maybe they don't achieve it that day but they are definitely st- striving to get there in the end of the podcast we always ask the, the guests to give like one piece of advice to uh, it could be to let's say leaders in the hospitality industry and restaurant industry what would your one piece of advice be that really in a way would you know if you could look at your career and what you learned would maybe take them further or next mm. level or perform better as a, in their job make a happier workplace I think that's the right question I had multiple thoughts around this and yeah. I just in my mind I I think it's a case of how can I seek to amaze and be amazed as a leader like how can I go out and excel not only with my own reflective understanding of who I am and surprise and delight the people that I work with, but also how can I allow them 
to surprise and delight me? And what can I pick up? What nuanced learnings can I learn from my employees, the people that I work with that will want to make me strive to be better? That's quite a good one because that's a, it's a difficult question to answer straight right. up because I always start thinking, what could I do in a way? And I always say leadership is a bit like the Rubik's Cube. Right. And you need, it's a life skill and you maybe find out how to solve different elements of leadership and that you're solving the Rubik's Cube, but you want to be faster at it. Yeah. Because the faster you get, the better your organization get. Right, exactly. And the more happy are people because you're solving their problems in a way because you're the servant. Right. You are there for people problems. Right? Exactly. That's a very good question, yeah. I will have to think about that. I don't have the answer <laughs> on that. So that's a, 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 that was a really good advice, yeah. What is the uh, next things on your journey? There's mm. a book coming. Spring 2020 is yeah. uh, the launch of my book, Love yeah. It or Leave It. And it's looking at how to help people fall in love with their job, think about ways in which they can really change their mindset, change their attitude to work and look at the culture that they're in or if they're going to leave what might leaving look like is it starting a business starting a portfolio career or finding a new job like getting under the skin of all of that I'm also working with more amazing clients and I have an online school called the growth and happiness school and through that I offer training to individuals who want to create happiness for others so as my core program is create growth and happiness at work and that's for employees it might be heads of talent HR individuals who who are looking to create ways to bring more happiness, well-being and culture strategies into the workplace that are a little bit left field. Good. We will put some uh, links in the, the podcast. Brilliant. If there's anyone out there that wants to have a chat with you, I'm sure there is, because you have some brilliant questions. If you as a leader interested in your answer, they can reach out to you. Yeah, sure. And I also, I do um, a great leadership workshop at The Guardian as well. So yeah, you can pop down and come and see me. <laughs> Good. Thank you very much, Samantha, for coming. It was uh, very enlightening and very different from what we normally would do. And I'm sure there's uh, like a couple of uh, hospitality and restaurant leaders would be inspired out there and whoever is fan of our podcast and follow us. So thank you very much for coming again. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. That's all we had time for today. If you enjoyed today's podcast, please give us a like, share, review or subscribe to one of our channels or sign up to our community updates at hospitalitymavericks.com. Thanks to Let's Talk Video Production for your ongoing podcast assistant. We hope you enjoyed today's podcast with me, Michael Tinkser. Tune in next time for another interview. And in the meantime, be maverick.